Hey guys, welcome to the Credible Nerds Podcast. My name is Justin, and I'm here with my fellow co-host, uh, Harry. How are you doing today? Doing good. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, so we're here to talk about uh, something that we've been involved with for quite some time, since 1983, right? Um, yeah. The Return of the Jedi had its 40th anniversary this year. Um, it was released in May of 1983. And just recently, uh, they re-released the film in theaters for a theatrical run. And it came out, I think, last weekend. Yeah. And so a couple of days ago. And it's running through this week. And I think it runs through this week and then it's, it's done. But I saw a report that it's number five in the box office take, you know, on the list for, the, for having, you know, as far as taking in the best amount of money. So I thought that was... Pretty interesting for um, for a 40-year-old movie, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, it's kind of wild, actually, because there's a lot of movies in the theater right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah. for it to be number five, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, Super Mario Brothers is in, and it's made over a billion, and uh, a couple other movies are doing well. So mm-hmm. kudos to Return of the Jedi. Seen pictures of people posting online that they're there in the theaters. Some theaters are full, some are not full. <laughs> just, it just seems like it's just them. So maybe like five or six people there. So I think it just varies on the theater, but uh, apparently it's doing well enough to pull in enough money for number five. So I have not yet seen it. I was tentatively planning it last weekend, but we'll get into it later. But it's not <laughs> as to why I didn't really go, but it's not on the top of my list for the, you know, Star Wars movies. So I wasn't super excited. I went, Empire Strikes Back came out in theater. I was, I was there, you know, as soon as I could. But this film, I was like, yeah, I kind of want to see it, but I'm not going to make plans to go see it necessarily. If, it, if, if I have time, I'll go. But, uh, so I did not see it. I'm, I might go this week. I kind of want to, um, just to experience that again. But for you, Harry, it sounds like um, you were telling me that some of the theaters that are showing are there's not one close, it sounds like. Yeah, it's it's distance for me. I wanted to see it just because it's Star Wars and it's right. on the big screen. Yeah. Um, but the closest theater is 45 minutes away in good traffic. Mm. And right now, traffic around here is never good. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's construction season. And yeah. there's, just, there's no good way to get to any of the AMC theaters. And it was going to be a nightmare. So I just kind of passed on it. Yeah. Plus, I found that it's hard to, like, if you own the movie, (laughs) you can just go downstairs, push play, sit in your couch, pause, go to the bathroom, get some snacks. Right. It's it's a lot easier to do that than go see it in theater. But there are some movies you got to see in theaters, and Star Wars is definitely one of them. So, you know, that's the conundrum for me anyway. Um, Same for me. Yeah. I mean, I own it in multiple formats. And (laughs) like you said, I can sit on the couch and have my own snacks and all that but um it's just i really don't like driving in detroit area traffic (laughs) and construction and it's like i'll pass yeah yeah i did just realize there might be a theater that's like just an easier way to get it's still just as far but it's easier Mm. and i was like ooh, maybe yeah maybe i'll run to that one yeah yeah so we may see it this week we may not (laughs) we'll let you know (laughs) Uh, so the 40th anniversary, uh, Star Wars Celebration Europe, or Star Wars Celebration was in Europe this year, and they had the honors of kind of handling the the celebration of this 40th anniversary. Um, for Star Wars Celebration Anaheim, it kind of was Empire Strikes Back. It was actually supposed to be 2020, but the pandemic pushed it back. So there was a little bit of celebration with Empire Strikes Back. Uh, the one before that was actually it was more Attack of the Clones for 2022, but um, you know, so every celebration tends to celebrate you know the movie that came out that year or close to it. So they got the 40th anniversary for for Empire or for Return of the Jedi, and if I remember correctly, they also got it for the 30th anniversary because I remember uh, after no, no, I'm wrong on that. Never mind. So. Uh, I was disappointed that I couldn't go to Celebration Europe or that there wasn't one here, but um, 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, and then obviously the movie was released in theaters like we talked about. So that seemed to be kind of the celebration of, Hey, return of the Jedi. It's the 40th anniversary. Was there anything else that you were aware of that is kind of celebrated Jedi this year? Um, I would think the only thing that I, I, I noticed would be like some Hasbro releases. Yeah, that's right. There's some black series figures, 40th anniversary, um, kind of the uh, original card back look yeah. to black series figures instead of the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I haven't gotten those ones yet. Again, I'll probably I'll explain why later, but I have star Wars. I have empire. I just haven't picked up uh, Jedi yet. So I, I would think these must have been in production for a while because Hasbro stopped using plastic in their <laughs> packaging. Yeah. So this might be the last set of, uh, uh, I, throwback yeah. card back releases. I heard they're bringing it back though. The plastic, maybe it's just some, you know, clickbait thing, but I have thought I saw something that they're Hasbro realized the error of their ways and they're going back to it. So I hope so. But as for now, so. for mean, now I, it's I, just the box. I open my packages. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I open them, so I don't care. <laughs> um, but when I got the first ones that were all cardboard, I was like, yeah, "People are not going to be happy because you've got nothing to display but a box." Yeah, with a picture. The box is just a picture. Yeah. So um, I could see them going back. Yeah. Hopefully they do. I mean, I mean, if people are buying, because a lot of people buy one to display, one to pull out and you know display and package when not you know maybe play with or pose or whatever so you're going to get it from that crowd you're not going to get a, a one to display you're just going to get they're just going to buy one instead of two or three i would think sure yeah so anyway well uh as far as return of the jedi goes uh, we both saw it in in um 1983 at least I'm assuming. I, I don't know. Did you? When did you see it, Harry? I'm, I'm just assuming. I, see, I don't have any distinct memories of it, but I'm 99% sure that I did. Okay. And that may have been one of the first movies I ever saw in a theater. Oh, so you were you know? kind of that. I was only years. seven. Yeah. Okay. Or, no, nine. I guess I would have been nine. No, that's not. That's not too young. Uh, but I, I I don't recall any other movie and. Um, for that movie, it's like I've always seen it. So it makes me think that I did. I just don't have a distinct memory of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was probably 10, so not too much older. Um, no, I was 11. Yeah, I was 11. And um, I remember seeing it. So what, the big thing is, at that time in my life, there was a movie theater about 20 minutes away, so we'd always go there. It was pretty easy to get to. And me and my friends were like, oh, I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark four times. Oh, I've only seen it twice. I got to catch up. You know, I got to see it five times. So we were always having that battle. And so I went and saw Return of the Jedi multiple times. And I remember bragging to my friend Trent about it. Like, I went and saw it this many times. And so I know I saw it. And uh, I remember liking it, obviously. And then I went and saw it. I went down. We live in Utah. We went down to Arizona to visit my cousins, and they hadn't seen it yet. So I was like, oh, we got to go see it. So we all went and saw it uh, with like five or six cousins of about my age. And I remember we were watching it, and it was like halfway through, and one of my cousins was like, is this the part where Darth Vader takes off his mask? <laughs> I was like, no, no, that's at the end. Keep, keep watching. So they, that's what they were there to see because I had I had kind of dropped some spoilers <laughs> to them, <laughs> so they were excited to see it. But so I remember seeing it, you know, a couple times, a couple of the times that I saw it. So um, then, obviously, um, like you said, we own it on on home video. How many formats would you say you have it on? Um, probably three. Um, I've got two copies on VHS. Oh. Uh, DVD, and I think I've got them, everything on Blu-ray now. I think I upgraded. Yeah. Um, so I think three, three yeah. formats, four copies. Okay. I did have it. I had. Do, I do have it on the, the one last time. You know, original. Buy it. See it one last time for a VHS. That that campaign, that marketing campaign, and then I know I bought the special editions, the gold ones. Uh, but I don't know where they are. I don't know what happened to those. I, maybe there's in a box somewhere, but I haven't seen them for a long time. 
uh, for VHS. Then, but then I bought them on DVD, and then um, they did this release where they released two discs for the original trilogy. One disc was the the, the original, not not necessarily the original, but like um, one of the 1980s releases, right? And then they released the special edition on that disc. So I have that copy. And then I have it on digital. I don't think I have it on Blu-ray because I think I just bought the, No, I do have it on Blu-ray. I bought the Steelbook Blu-ray and then I have the digital copy. So, But I only watched the digital. I mean, <laughs> the others are for display, basically. Yeah, I haven't put one of them in in a while um just with disney plus just click yeah on, right? there's disney and, plus yeah <laughs> um it's it's simple um i guess when I'm, I'm in a movie a real movie experience and i want the surround sounds um because i can't figure out how to get my tv to work with the surround sounds just the tv but mm -hmm. the blu-ray player works yeah. so then I'll, I'll drop the disc in yeah okay cool uh and i i saw the movie in at celebration chicago uh, they, it wasn't part of celebration. It was, uh, a Disney, yeah. one of the Disney clubs. I can't remember the name of it, but if you were a member, I think it was the gold member club or something. I don't know. If you remember, then they gave you free tickets. So I bought a, I had a couple and I went with, uh, my, my son and yeah, I think it was just me and my son. Oh, and, and my friend Mark obviously was there. So that was the last time I saw it in theaters was 2019. And then that's four years ago, if you think about it. So Sure. And I was thinking about that when we were writing up the notes. I was like, it's been a while. It seems like it was just the other day. But, you know, it's been four years. So, yeah, it's, that's what I started thinking. Well, maybe I should go see it again. So um, I don't know. What's your – do you have any memories of, of watching it growing up? Like I said, I, I told my cousins and spoiled them, and they were all excited, and we went and saw it. So do you have any memories like that, it's going with friends or family or anything? I, not, or maybe, not really. Or maybe um, afterwards? Um, I, the movie theater we had was right in town. I mean, so it was like five, eight minutes away. And it was one of the old school with the big, you know, neon marquee and the, <laughs> you know, the – the theater lights and all that and you bought your ticket on the curb and then walked inside to the lobby yeah. and it was yeah. old school and cool because one of my first star wars memories really i mean other than the toys would was uh, watching the people for empire lined up around the block at that theater yeah because we had just moved into town and people are lined up like crazy and uh, i thought it was pretty exciting but i really don't remember seeing empire so it was definitely jedi mm -hmm. For the longest time, um, it was a movie we watched all the time. And I don't know if it's because we had gotten a copy of it somehow mm -hmm. or if it was on TV more or um, if one of my siblings, um, that was like their request, um, like when we went and rented a, a movie. Yeah. As, I mean, geez, I don't even know what year the first year it was available to purchase. It wasn't 1983 no. or 84. <laughs> no. Um, and so it was one we watched a lot growing up, and I don't remember exactly why. For a long time, it was probably my, well, I mean, geez, you only had three to be top three, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it was number two, um, and um, probably my sister loved the Ewoks, so she was always wanting to watch Return of the Jedi. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, we went and saw it in theaters, the special edition. You remember that? When we were li living together and the special editions yeah. came out, we we're all excited and oh, that was a great time. It was like one a month, right? For like January, February, yeah. March, or something. So yeah, yeah, I remember when we saw that. So I was, I mean, we didn't expect that, right? Yeah, so. I just like all of a sudden new, new, right? <laughs> new scenes, new Star Wars was out, so that was exciting for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this. In this edition, the special edition of, of Return of the Jedi, what what were the the additions? Do you remember there was um, more creatures? I think it's hard to d differentiate between the original special edition and the DVD special edition, right? It is because they keep Lucas kept adding stuff, but I think there was more aliens in Jabba's palace. For sure, yep, that was one of the big ones. Yeah, uh, and then. Uh, 
the palace and the sail barge were both a little more full. Yeah. Is this is this where they changed the door to be, make it bigger, or was that later in the 2000s? I think that might have mm. been the 2000s. Yeah, it might have been. The Sarlacc was a little different. Yeah, that's right. The beak was added. Yes, yes. Which, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's. Uh, I like the idea, but uh, I like the original better. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, the Darth and Vader, stuff, no. Go ahead. The other stuff, I, I, I guess it was so minor that yeah. it just didn't pick up on it. Yeah. The Darth Vader, no was uh the one of the later things right from the for the dvd or digital yes so we yes do, mm, we do a quick search here what the additions were because for um a new hope there was a lot i think a new hope and empire were the more prevalent ones <clears throat> let's see here Right in a New Hope and Empire, there was just lengthened scenes in some places, mm-hmm. um, and then more <clears throat> more stuff. Uh, instead of the matte paintings, there was the moving things and and more architecture and creatures and ships. Yeah, so Jabba's palace had an establishing shot of a bantha herd was inserted, the CGI beak and tentacles for the sarlacc. Oh, Jabba's dialogue was given subtitles? Was there not subtitles initially? I don't remember that. Wow, uh, that would be tough. I mean, I guess I've seen this the special edition more. Yeah. And and more recently, so it just seemed like it always had subtitles, but Yeah. Uh the Blu-ray added a dug to the inside of the palace. Um Okay, I remember reading about that. Yeah. As I remember that. And then, oh, the the Max Rebo band, Snice Noodles, right? That's so they, right. They the, changed the, the song, Jedi Rocks. <laughs> what do you, what yeah. do you think about Jedi Rocks compared to the original Lopty Nick? Uh, I, it, I, it was one of those things you're like, what were you thinking? Because <laughs> this takes away from the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like the CGI wasn't great, and it's just it's so in your face. That yeah, I was like, yeah, could have done without this. Yeah, I think I agree. So I guess they originally had they had a puppet for size noodles, but then they replaced her with CGI in the special edition. So there's that. Uh, Boba Fett, more footage of Boba Fett flirting with uh, the dancers there. Um. Let's see. Oh, in the original theatrical release, Ula, the original, the green dancer, fell inside the rancor, rancor pit and her scream was heard off screen. But in the special edition, they had extra shots of her inside the pit. And then, that, you know, they, she's still killed, but this, and the screen, the scream is still off screen. So, uh, the second Death Star, um, yeah, that's the scene. Oh yeah, the the original special edition doesn't change much, but the 2011 special edition has the Vader no. Oh, in the original, yeah, he says he starts saying no, and then they uh, in 2004 they um, added hating no. They had, oh, that's different. They, they removed his eyebrows. Sebastian Stan's eyebrows. At the, okay. <laughs> and the changes eye Which, color. I mean, I guess makes sense. No eyebrows. Uh, all that scarring, they're never coming back. Yeah. And then in 2004, they replaced uh, Sebastian Shaw with uh, Hayden Christensen for the first ghost. Oh, and then the victory celebration, and then the end scene, right? Forgot about that. Oh, that's right. Yes, the victory celebration, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, the across the galaxy, mm-hmm. which it's... was an addition I really liked. Yeah, yeah. So he replaced the Yub Nub song with just a a John Williams song. 
Uh, he created a, something, the victory celebration. So then they had the planets of Coruscant, Bespin, Tatooine, and then we see the the Jedi Temple. Uh, we hear a Gungan. <laughs> well, that's later in the the 2004 edition, but uh, yeah. So they toppled. Was the there stage. not Naboo added into that, that view of the planets in one of the editions? Yeah, later on. Oh, okay. I was gonna the, say because I, I, it was just Bespin and Coruscant initially, and then they added in a few more later. Did, yeah, it's Bespin, Coruscant, Tatooine in '97. But then after the the prequel, the Phantom Menace in '99, two years later, they added Naboo. So, so yeah, there's some some good. Uh, I liked the the victory celebration change. The uh, Jabba's palace changes were good. So, some good stuff for the special edition. Yeah, and that's. And these ones, they added some other stuff like we were talking about. And that, that's the definitive edition that we see now, right? If you're going to buy the movie or purchase it on digital or watch it on Disney+, Plus, that's the version we're going to see is these updated ones. And there's a lot of fan complaints that they want to see the original, original theatrical release. Um, I don't really care for it in the sense that like I said, I had bought the DVDs that have the, you know, the one of the original versions. I think it's even then it's still updated a little bit. Uh, and they're just they're just old, you know. One thing about Star Wars is they hold up pretty well forty years later, the the original movies. And you watch those original ones without the changes, and you they're dated, you know. At least in my opinion, and I I tried to watch them; <laughs> they were kind of boring. Uh, they just weren't as, as exciting and, and good as the, the ones. Now, you can argue the, the different special edition changes, but I think overall the special edition changes kept it more relevant and more interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, and added a little flash here and there mm-hmm. and some more life to scenes that were yeah. kind of, like I said, boring. Mm-hmm. Um, just you know, shooting it with a matte screen, it's difficult to have anything moving, right? It's, yeah. Yeah, over that same map though, you can CGI in a ton of stuff, and then it, it's pretty flawless. Yeah. The the changes um, for the most part were, were done pretty well, and uh, livened up the movies and and cleaned up the little scenes, and just the life that's added just makes them a little better. And um, so for the most part, I don't have any problem with the 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 additions. Um, it is strange at this point, though, that it's been so long since I've seen the original that I forget what's been added over yeah. time. Yeah. Just the special edition is, is the version, right? It's the version now. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Well, so overall, I like this movie. Uh, there are a lot of good things in this movie. Um, and let's talk about our favorite things. Uh, some of the top five things that I like about this movie, uh, we get to see, you know, probably top of the list, if not number one, is just Luke igniting his green lightsaber for the first time. You know, having because that was the big question. He lost his lightsaber in Empire Strikes Back. Um, what is he going to do now? We saw him get his hand at the end of Empire. Got that uh, prosthetic hand, but what about a lightsaber? What's he going to do? Is he going to build a new one? Is he going to find a new one? What's going on? And uh, while we didn't get the the deleted scene till much later of him building it, uh, we do get to see it, the finished product, and it's green, green blade. And that was exciting for fans. But I remember, I actually don't remember in the trailer, but they did show in the trailer, one of their first trailers, it, the lightsaber was blue, but they felt that that would be too confusing. So they, they changed it to green to let us know, Hey, this is, this one's different. So, uh, what'd Were you think about some, the, uh, some filming issues as well? Yeah, I like think the there was, and, yeah. And, and just the blue sky, it didn't show very well. And, mm-hmm. uh, but overall I preferred the change because it's a definitive change. Now mm-hmm. he has a new lightsaber. Right. It's a new Kyber crystal. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. So, so I liked it. Um, and then just having the green lights that were throughout the film, I really enjoyed seeing it. So, 
And then the hilt was awesome. It's pretty cool. Reminiscent of Obi-Wan, but it was his, his own thing. So pretty cool. Uh, what about for you? What's one of your favorite, favorite things about uh, Jedi? I think I'll, I'll just never forget the big battle scene. Mm-hmm. This is the first time we see the entire rebel fleet all together. And then it's just this massive space battle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got capital ships and, you know, light frigates flying around and then just swarms of, of snub fighters, mm-hmm. X wings and B wings and A wings and Y wings and, and, uh, you know, just masses of TIE fighters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was just, it was really cool. This is huge space battle scene. Uh, it's something, you know, we had thought about all the time, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there was no toys for most of these ships, but you're like, oh, they have these big ships and they're fighting the Imperial fleets, and and now here it is on the screen. So it was really cool for me. Yeah, the capital ships and all that stuff too. Death Star taking out the the rebel capital ships. That was that was pretty cool to see. And the different aesthetic of the Mon Calamari ships versus everything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes as well, along with the indoor ground battle, the lightsaber battle in the Death Star, just that whole big sequence there at the end. And I think that's something that Star Wars has always done well. We we saw hints of it in uh, A New Hope, where you had Vader and Obi-Wan fighting on the Death Star, but it wasn't like part of the last battle. So you had that, and then you had the big space battle at the end. There wasn't a ground battle. So it kind of had that impetus there. And then in Empire, you had the ground battle. And then Jedi is like, okay, let's put them all together and have it going on at the same time and cut back and forth between all three of them and see the heroes having successes, having failures, and then overcoming there at the end. So I thought it was, you know, obviously it's the climax of the saga, at least at that time that we thought it was. uh, Two different times. (laughs) Uh, It's just great storytelling. It was great to see you know, that whole thing. But yeah, the space battle was pretty amazing. Um, I think for me, another, what so that's one of mine as well. Uh, one that I really enjoyed was just kind of seeing the the group back to get, together, the heroes back together. With First off, we see them kind of come together at uh, on Tatooine with Jabba's palace to rescue Han. But then you also see it um, in Endor the, when they go to that moon of Endor and, you know, they're in the shuttle, they land, they're walking through the forest. There's a speeder bike chase with Luke and Leia, kind of get them working together again like they did in A New Hope because we didn't really see that in um, The Empire Strikes Back, right, till the very end. But right. You got them together. You got Luke and Han working together as they try to find Leia. And then, you know, it's just, it's just awesome. That is like the original trilogy at its best is when those guys are together solving problems, having adventures, fighting the empire. Right. So it was, that was probably my, I think overall that is my favorite thing about, um, Return of the Jedi. It's not like a specific event. It's just those guys back together again, having their space adventures. It, for sure, right? We, if the saga started with those three um, and has added you know, other characters in here and there, but it really revolves around them. Mm-hmm. Um, Empire, they were split up a lot. And then at the end of Empire, like Han's gone. Is he mm-hmm. coming back? Is he yeah. gone for good? Yeah. Um, did he really survive being carbon froze? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, so yeah, seeing him... Um, you know, rescue Han, and then they're back together, and they've added in Lando as this cool buddy, yeah. um, who's just you know an effective part of the team, and um, so we've expanded a little bit, but the, the core is back together. Mm-hmm. Did you buy Lando um, his redemption arc? I guess you now he's a good guy. Did it seem out of place, or did it fit good? What do you think? Uh, I guess I never doubted Lando. Um, we talked, I think, a little off camera last time about it, but just he was in a really bad place with the Empire. Mm-hmm. And um, he was a scoundrel for most of his life, but as the administrator of Bespin, he had you know thousands or tens of thousands of people that he was legit worried about. And um, trying to make the best of a terrible situation, he made that deal with Han. 
And I think his plan all along was to, to rescue him. Mm-hmm. And um, it, he didn't think, uh, well, because the plan changed immediately for the Empire, right? So they, were, um, they couldn't leave now. Where he was, I think he was planning, Boba gets in his ship, we're going to take off immediately after him. I know where he's going. Mm-hmm. We can intercept him on the way when it's just Boba, and we'll get Han back. Um, they got delayed and then had to put in you know, this little cool raid um, of all these little parts meeting up together and suckering Java into letting them all into the palace. And yeah. um, So I think there was, uh, it was just, uh, it was a redemption, but it was because he had to make a terrible decision for a whole bunch of people and then he regretted it immediately and then immediately he started in that same moment started his rescue sequence upon let's make this better yeah yeah I, I, I had the same thoughts I, like I never thought Lando was a bad guy he had like you said he was forced into making this decision that he was either die or or turn over this this other guy that he hadn't seen for a while but he still considered him a friend I guess and so it was just a hard situation to be in. And so being able to, I mean, he redeems himself in the sense that he corrects the the wrong that he had, the wrong choice he had to make. So, um, so I thought it was good to actually see that. And then he goes, he continues on then too, right? He doesn't say, well, Pond's Pond's yeah. free, he's yeah. safe, and see y'all, I'm going back to my wayward ways. Yeah. Um, in his time interacting with them, he realizes, hey, the Empire is terrible. I have skills. Um, my friends, uh, new friends, right, for Luke and Leia. Mm-hmm. Um, but my friends um, are fighting for a better galaxy. And he doesn't turn his back on them, right? Mm-hmm. From from the very end of Empire, he's hunting for Han. And then at, from the beginning of, of Jedi, he's right there. And then doesn't take off. But next time we see him he's wearing a general's uniform and yeah. he's actively part of the attack on death star 2 yeah yeah i agree yep good points uh what's another good thing about this movie that you like it's lando lando and the falcon <laughs> okay like it's just like his sheer joy when he's sitting in the cockpit yeah and like his fearlessness as he's leading them into battle um we see him kind of like we can see him as the smuggler that was, you know, um, Lando's always been the coolest dude in the star Wars galaxy for me. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just a, he's so uh, he's over the top, but he's also supremely confident in his abilities and it's kind of, it, he's really cool to watch him and then seeing him like in the Falcon, it's like, it was really, really cool. And then just leads this successful attack, right? He is, He's a great pilot, and um, and that fearlessness shows up. It's, I mean, who else is flying a freighter into the guts of a Death Star? <laughs> yeah, uh, just him. Some of that. Just him, right? So I, I think that's one of my favorite parts is, is Lando and the Falcon. Mm-hmm. Awesome, yeah. Uh, so an- another thing that I really liked uh, is kind of what you said, Lando flying the Falcon – but it's not only him; it's him and Wedge, right? They they fire the proton torpedoes to blow it up. Um, Chewie has his moment where he, with him and some Ewoks, they overpower a, a Scout Walker and start uh, blowing up other Scout Walkers, and that turns the tide for that battle, that ground battle. Um, you know, so all these these secondary characters. C three PO has his moment when he is able to talk to the Ewoks and kind of convince them to, to help them, uh, help the, our heroes. And R2 has his moment where, you know, he's always, they're always doing something to help out and just everybody has a part to play. It's not just Luke saving the day or Han saving the day. It's everybody having their moment and playing a part in, in doing this. So <clears throat> just seeing them all be successful and contribute to this victory, I thought was a pretty cool thing to see. So. Yeah, um, when you mentioned Wedge there, because you know, Wedge is kind of a background character in A New Hope, and he's a little more prominent in the the Battle of Hoth. Mm-hmm. Um, and but then we don't see him anymore. But then now he's back as, as kind of this this squadron commander 
And so, yeah, seeing him be have a bigger role and then play part of the key in destroying the Death Star is, is cool. But then everybody, right? Like you said, it's everybody's got a little part. Had everybody not played their part and um, and successfully pulled off whatever shenanigans they had, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it doesn't come together. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Uh, what's another thing for you? Another favorite um, thing? Uh, I'm going to say seeing Jabba's palace. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have this inkling that Jabba's a, a, a big bad guy, right? And, um, and for me, it's always a new hope. The, the, the threat of Jabba to Han uh, versus seeing him mm-hmm. in, in the special edition, the threat of this gangster who, who scares people. He's powerful. He can have people killed. Bounty hunters work for him. It's like, who is this guy? And like, what kind of operation does he run? And then we show up at this, you know, this palace, this fortress, and it's just full of the worst of the worst. Mm-hmm. That was really cool for me. Mm-hmm. Bunch of cool characters and, and just finally seeing Jabba as this, this interstellar gangster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I wish they would have got to explore that movie in the movies more. Obviously, they, they did in the Clone Wars, which was great. Um, but it didn't have that same impact that the movies have. But um, Okay. Uh, for me, another thing, uh, I think... Yeah, I think I've said all mine, or you, we have similar ones. So is there anything else for you that uh, you would want to bring up for the, your favorite uh, things? The, um, one, um, it's, it's kind of minor, but it was fun to see the A-Wings. Yeah, um, to cool. see a new fighter, um, yeah. I guess the B wing was new too. But, but the A wing for me was like just this cool little super fast, <laughs> um, powerful fighter. Um, and it was before we knew kind of the backstory, right? Because all of that was fleshed out in novels and comics and other things about how it was built as a, a direct um, result of the, the Tie Interceptor. Mm. But seeing it flying around this tiny little thing that's so fast. And then it has that pivotal moment in destroying the Super Star Destroyer mm-hmm. uh, was, was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then I think the only other thing was the commando raid to Endor. Yeah. Um, it's a scene, because to me, this is the Rebel Alliance in action, right? Not the big battle on Hoth that they were forced into. They weren't really the, ready. It, exactly. And just an overwhelming Imperial force shows up and... Um, dominates them the uh the difference is here it's exactly what the rebel does well the rebel alliance does well right this small commando raid going out to take a specific targets and that was just kind of cool they're all in camo and they have different rifles from the other rebel troopers and different uniforms and then they just go to town yeah yeah for sure the the a-wings i the tie interceptors were pretty cool pretty cool too it seems like every movie there was a new ship right first it was the tie fighters and then it was the tie bombers and then it's tie interceptors so i like that progression um but probably i just remember one last thing that was pretty awesome about the movie can't believe i didn't remember it till now but the the emperor right this is we've heard about him since a new hope we saw a hologram of him in empire strikes back and then we actually get to see him. He's a main character in this movie. Uh, and he, you know, the actor Ian McDiarmid played him perfectly. Um, thought he was a, a great villain for sure. One of the, the most iconic of all time. So, and just the force lightning and him egging on Luke, you know, to strike him down, uh, give in to the dark side. You know, it was just uh, such. So that's good acting there. So really enjoyed the, the introduction of the emperor. So what about you? What do you think about Darth Sidious, even though we didn't know him by that name at that point? Yeah, it was, like you said, we've heard about him for a long time, right? He's the, the head of the empire. We re- have really haven't seen him much, just in holograms. And here he is. Mm-hmm. He's terrifying. He's powerful. Um, and he's all plotting, right? He's, he's, allowed the rebel alliance to find out about this second death star um but it's you know well ahead of production and it's ready to go when they show up and he has a plan to wipe out the rebellion yeah and um 
and you know something we don't know until later, right? But there's foreshadowing there that I don't know if it was on purpose. Um, but he's you know strike me down, and it's because <laughs> he doesn't care, right? He's already got his clone plan. Yeah. Um, when Luke strikes him down, he becomes another Sith Lord. He'll just have him off Vader, and he's got him as an apprentice, a, a younger, more powerful apprentice. And the Emperor comes back. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy is truly one of the the great villains of all time. Yeah. Yeah, we thought Darth Vader was awesome, and he's he is. It's just you know the Emperor is his master, right? So if you're, right. if you're going to have a badass villain and he has a master, you know, this master guy better be pretty awesome too. So, right. And it, you know, we forget now after 40 years, like we're comfortable with the emperor, mm-hmm. but at this time when he's revealed, it's, it, it's totally new. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we saw the emperor come to be really in, in the prequel trilogy. And then, you know, we see him again in his master plotting and in um, the sequels Mm-hmm. Um, and we even see Vader, uh, like in Rogue One, and and then in comic books and in uh, the Obi Wan TV series, we see him like bigger and badder than ever, and truly terrifying. But by the time of Return of the Jedi, we hadn't seen any of those things, mm-hmm. and it was a big shock and surprise. And you're like, "Holy smokes! Look at this bad guy!" Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so there's a lot of things, a lot of good things about this movie, but there are some things that bother me or I don't, I call them my least favorite because they're not like bad things. They're just my least favorite, (laughs) meaning they're still good. But uh, for me, you mentioned Jabba's Palace as your favorite, uh, one of your favorite things. Mine was one of my least favorite things is Jabba's Palace in in the sense that uh, it could have been better. And may, they, you know, I have to remind myself in 1983, they are 82 when they were making it, they did the best they could, which was pretty amazing for the time. But even then I remember watching it and I was like, well, why are they afraid of that guy? He's fat. <laughs> he just sits there. You push him around on his, 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 uh, platform. Are they really, you know, scared of him? <laughs> So that's kind of the where I'm coming from. I liked him as a character, but he wasn't very menacing. He was just big and fat and didn't do much. He had power because he could tell people, "You kill him, you kill him, you do this." You know, he had that. So that was kind of his thing. But I wasn't necessarily afraid of him of what he could. I didn't feel like our characters were in that much danger, really. So that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean. He doesn't have the force. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he doesn't carry a blaster. I mean, he can't even hardly reach anything. His little stubby yeah. T-Rex yeah. arms. He can just get um, his frogs to eat. So he's He has all these people to control him, or that he controls. But uh, that's true. It's like, why do they even follow him? Yeah. Why doesn't somebody like Boba Fett just off him yeah. and, and be done with it? Um, I... I guess the Clone Wars maybe answers that a little bit. It, yeah. it, you know, he's Jabba, but there's other huts. Um, but by the same token, they're all fat slugs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why a whole bunch of their their lieutenants haven't taken them out by this point and and created a, just a new leadership mm-hmm. circle inside the hut cartel? Um, yeah. It's true, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, why are we scared of this big guy? Yeah. Um, other than if he's trying to give you a kiss and you're chained to him. <laughs> yeah, that's that's nasty. So that's one of my things. So, uh, what about for you? What's another thing? At least favorite, um, right? I, and and it, this is, again, this is technology of the time, right? It was the lightsaber in the daylight scenes. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't as cool as it is in the dark. Yeah. Um, it, it, so it, it just kind of lost some of it because it's just even being green – it's it's lost to this bright Tatooine twin suns, and um, it's just like oh man, it would have been so much cooler if we you know had seen this a little better, and or if like more of his fight scenes were like on the Death Star, right? Because that was awesome, you know, the red and the green battling out, and it was super cool because it was dark. Yeah, um, and it, it's again, it's a minor thing. It's it's nothing huge, but it's just like could this have been done different or better or maybe all of his fighting is inside mm-hmm. um, the sail barge so we can just see the lightsaber better and, and see the battle better. Yeah. yeah. It's minor. Yeah. Uh, another thing for me is the Ewoks. <laughs> that's a, 
that's a common target that people use. Oh, the Ewoks are stupid. Um, but I don't think they're stupid. I just don't think, again, I don't feel like I, I understand why they were in, in the story. You know, they, Lucas wanted to com- compare and contrast technology with native populations and how the natives could overthrow the, the empire. Right. Um, and I like that concept, but the Ewoks weren't the best representation of that in my mind. You know, they're too small. They're not very quick and mobile <laughs> to be able to win a battle in, and I, I have gone back and watched it with that, like, what are they trying to show here, tell us here? And I have noticed that it's not necessarily the Ewoks that overthrow the, the, the Empire on that ground battle. They provide a distraction so that the heroes can break free, right? That's, that's their main purpose in this. Uh, they come in, they shoot bow and arrows, they throw... Uh, rocks at them, the stormtroopers, and kind of disperse the empire. They're like, oh, go get them. So then they're not centralized so that the heroes can take advantage of this distraction and escape, which they do. And then it's the heroes working with the Ewoks who are there on the planet and can, you know, help them navigate the terrain that actually turn the tide of the battle and overcome the empire. So... I recognize that, that it wasn't just the Ewoks rising up, killing stormtroopers, and that's how they won. It was they provided the distraction for the heroes to do the job. But I just, and maybe, you know, I saw it as a 12-year-old kid, so I wasn't into the cuteness factor at that point. You know, I was going into my teenage years, and then obviously as an adult, I'm like, eh, they're not. But my daughter loves them. (laughs) I think she still has an affinity for them as a, you know, a college student, she likes the Ewoks. And so, you know, I see why the, the appeal, and I'm not knocking that appeal. And I don't want to come across as the Ewoks suck and all that stuff. Cause I, I don't like that approach with that fans take just for me. It's my least, one of my least favorite things about the movie. How, yeah, how, the same, um, I, I, I kind of see it the same way. I understand. Um, I mean, I guess there's always the rumors that they, it was supposed to be, um, Wookiees. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that would have been cool. For, um, right. Cause the Wookiees have like technology with the natural worlds mm-hmm. and they're fierce warriors. Yeah. Um, that would have been super cool. Yeah. Um, because we just never see enough of the Wookiees throughout the entire, all of the media. Yeah. That would have been super cool. Um, but the cuteness, um, and, and it, it's, you know why um, I've defended other things to fans, right? There always needs to be a cuteness because mm-hmm. at the at the end, Star Wars is a family movie, right? And we want to be able to share it with our children or grandchildren or whatever. Um, it's it's not a movie that you can't take uh, the younger generation to. And if there's a little bit cute or a little bit silly, um, they latch onto that and they love it that much when they're young and it sticks with them. Yeah. So the Ewoks were super cute and I won't lie. I had all the Ewok action figures when I was a kid. <laughs> oh yeah. We, uh, we all did. <laughs> um, and I mean, I think two of the, the, the funniest scenes in, in Jedi it involved the Ewoks when they smash that ATST with the two big logs, they smash the head of it. Right. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> take that. Yeah. And then when they trip the one with the other logs falling down the hill, and they're like, ah, bipedal in the forest makes sense now, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Take that, Empire scum. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's not that I hate them. It's just, it's my least favorite part of it. Right. Uh, and it's it, it's that, and it kind of, we all, I also come from the, the same thing that you did. You mentioned it could have been better, you know. Right. But if they would have tried Wookiees back then, maybe it would have been terrible. So we would. <laughs> we wouldn't be singing those praises, but right. It, it could still be our least favorite part of it <laughs> yeah. because it was done poorly. And it's like, yeah, it would have been cooler if it was something different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything, any other least favorites for you? I don't know. I don't really think so because for the longest time, it was one of my favorite star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. And, um, I liked that it was climactic and it, like you've mentioned before, it tied in the, 
the lightsaber battle and the space battle and the ground assaults. And um, we have to see these many aspects of the, the Rebel Alliance coming together for victory and then um, celebrating at the end. So I don't know. I don't think I have anything else. I think it's just those, it's just really minor quibbles about the yeah. movie for me. Yeah. I wrote down skiff battle and that's kind of the, I think that's a little unfair. So I, I'm going to take that back. But where I was coming from was just, wasn't well executed in my mind. Like it had the potential, but I don't know. I think I'm just being too critical at this point. So I'll take that off the list. All right. So a lot of good things. Uh, I mean, we have our quibbles, but overall there's a lot of good things about this movie and I don't want the, these quibbles to stand out as the main part of this podcast. Cause there's so many good things. Um, but how does, um, 40 years later, how does this movie hold up to first of all, the rest of the saga and then just kind of movies in general? What do you think? Uh, I think it still holds up. I think all of the original Star Wars movies hold up really well to science fiction movies, even after 40 years. Yeah. Um, the uh, pioneering practical effects um, really changed everything. And there's still times when you're watching it, and I'm like, how on earth did they do that in 1981, 82? Mm-hmm. It's just like, it still is amazing today. Um, and you can still, you can go frame by frame and you're like that model was incredible and the way they filmed that and and did that it was just really really cool um so i think it holds up really really well um i mean there's been other star wars movies that have come since that have you know pushed it down my list of favorites Mm -hmm. but it's not because it's not a good movie it's just there's stuff i like more or uh, or you know there's just different things than other movies that help them climb the list right yeah. Um, I think, like you said, <clears throat> all the Star Wars movies hold up really well, Com- especially compared to other sci-fi fantasy movies or even just movies in the 80s, right? A lot of them are bad <laughs> right now. You know, you go back and watch them and I go, oh, that was stupid. Uh, why did I like that? Um, but the these Star Wars original trilogy movies are, you know, they push the boundary for technology, for filmmaking, for you know a lot of a lot of different areas and they still hold up i think uh out of all of them though i think they're of the the three original trilogy films this one would be the most benefited by technology like if you were to redo it i guess not that i want that to happen i think this one would benefit the most from having that up those updates just because of all the different scenes because i think one of my criticisms of Return of the Jedi is I don't know if it's the production value like I feel like it, it's not as good as the the first two like I feel like the like the models are good but like the explosions when the Death Star shooting the capital ships it's kind of like oh let's have a big fire and then pull the you know it's just it's kind of wonky like it doesn't seem like the ship exploded it just seems like they put a, a explosion effect over like superimpose it over the the model or something to that effect. Yeah, when you said that production value, that was the first thing I thought of was the explosions. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, there is something, not was, it is. There is something a little bit wonky about the explosions in Jedi. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know what it is. Did they get rushed to a release date? And and yeah. which is they, good. Which I don't, I don't know, right? Because I don't know the actual history, but. The explosions in in A New Hope and um, Empire Strikes Back were, were better, mm-hmm. and you know their previous movies. So what happens that we've got these kind of wonky, weird, um, unfinished explosions? Yeah. And then I think the prime example is when the Super Star Destroyer crashes into the the Death Star. It's <laughs> it's not that good. It's. It looks yeah, it's like strange. it's on a, a set. Like it looks like a model. The fire's weird, like wonky, like we've been saying. It's just, and it's surprising because ILM has been so awesome at everything, right? In this era, but just with this, it didn't. It doesn't match the rest of the trilogy, like you said. Yeah. So there's 
that for sure could benefit from, Mm -hmm. I mean, if he's going to redo anything, if they're going to touch it up again, um, (laughs) fix those explosions, um, set some gasoline bombs off and, you know, (laughs) film those and superimpose over the superimpose. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's those type of things, and then the lighting is weird in some of the scenes. Like it, the I don't know, and those are like small things, but they just they're noticeable to me. Like I don't notice those things when I'm watching the other two movies, but in this one, I'm like, why is there like like on Endor at the end of the battle? There's the light's too bright for um when it's the heavy forest. Yeah. That could be at the outside because a lot of it is set in pieces, but here in, in indoor, that's a lot of outside shooting. But, but why? But why is it bright? Right, you got these massive trees. Shouldn't it be pretty dark down here on the, the forest yeah. floor? Yeah. Um, yes, for sure. There's some weird things, um, which makes me want to look back. Was he? Tr- did, did he wander off to another project? And <laughs> there was minions finishing the movie, and uh, or or you no? Know, because my... there. My, there are some unfinished aspects to it. Yeah. My, um, I think there's, I have two things, two hypotheses, I guess. First one is Richard Marquand. Um, I don't know how he ended up with um, the director's job. Because first of all, he wasn't that good. He was, wasn't um, very well, uh, he didn't have a lot of, like movies under his belt, I guess. So that was always a curious thing. And then, uh, cause if you look at the directing for the first two, they're pretty awesome. And this one just, and I've read, you know, the making of books and it seems like he got in, he got into it over his head pretty quickly. And George Lucas had to spend a lot of time just basically being the ghost director, like, Hey, you should probably do this or, you know, kind of mentoring him as, as the movie went on. So he was over involved and maybe that's what it was. It, he had to spend so much time with Richard Marquand that he couldn't supervise these other things that were going on that needed okay. to happen. So those are, that's my theory, I guess. And then there was one other thing. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at here. So was Rich, was this Richard Marquand? Was he um, was he forced on Lucas as a director? Did Lucas choose him? He, he chose him. Yeah. So, and I think this was they were looking at people like, um, what's the dude that did Dune? Um, oh, I can't remember his name. I think Steven Spielberg was on the list, but he turned it down and then uh, some other famous directors. It, and I think it came down to because Lucas wasn't in the Directors Guild anymore because when he released Star Wars, they, you know, he, it, back in the day, you had to have the credits before the movie started. And Star Wars didn't. It just started with the crawl, right? The movie crawl. And went into the movie so there's no credits so they find him on the first movie because of that and then when he did the second movie they kick he's like well i'm not doing that this is my sh- you know this is what i'm doing so i think they kicked him out of the director's guild at that point and so then he couldn't use anybody that was associated with the director's guild and since mark one was uh, british he wasn't part of the guild so he could fill in <laughs> so okay it down to. it's so um, stupid Jeez, I, I guess I didn't even know that. So I haven't looked tons. I haven't read any books or looked tons into the making of it. Um, it's one of those weird things I have that I don't want to ruin the magic. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so that makes sense, though. I mean, Hollywood is weird with their rules and uh, regulations. And yeah, um, I, I, it would make it force you to make some choices that maybe you wouldn't make otherwise. Yeah. And my second theory is The Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars was produced by Gary Kurtz. Um, and Return of the Jedi, I guess Lucas and Kurtz got into some arguments and didn't like how they were working together. So he left, Kurtz left, I think during uh, Empire, if not there at the end. And he was replaced by Howard Kazanjian. So, and so he brought in you know new people 
got his crew. <clears throat> and so I think that's the biggest difference as to why the return of the Jedi feels so much different than the first two because of, of those changes. And so, um, and again, it's not like Return of the Jedi is a bad movie. I like the story of the Jedi. I like the characters of Jedi. It's just this production value. And Howard Kazanjian has done, he did Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, that's how he got brought in. Uh, it was through that um, association. He, he does a good job. It's just, it didn't translate or it didn't, for me, it didn't translate for Jedi. And I would say that's my biggest criticism of the movie is just that. For better yeah, or I mean, you, you can produce a certain style of movie and be mm -hmm. awesome at it, right? Because yeah. Raiders is one of the most incredible movies of, in, you know, it's in my top 10 list of all movies and will always be there. Right. Um, but then to go do sci-fi, um, space opera, um, <laughs> it's a little bit different. It's a shift in mindsets and yeah. maybe he wasn't best for it. But um, yeah. uh, minor stuff, really, um, it's still... Still holds up all this after all this time, though, um, and it's, it's not like it. I mean, if I'm doing a Star Wars rewatch, it, it'll be one of the ones that I feel like. Oh, let's watch Jedi again. Yeah, let's watch the the Empire Fall. Yeah, yeah. So, well, how would you rank it in your overall Star Wars saga list? List of movies, one through um, eleven. We're gonna count Solo, and we're gonna count Rogue One. Five or six, probably. Okay, so middle of the pack. Yeah, solidly in the middle of the pack. Um, kind of would bounce, you know, forwards and back between like Phantom Menace, like those two kind of jockey for position, um, mm -hmm. just depending on my mood. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good point. Like I could, like my mood and what I'm into at the at the moment, right? This is kind of how I rank them. What would so it's five or six? What's the previous like? What's one through six then? Or one uh, through five? Rogue One, okay. Solo, A New Hope, uh, Revenge of the Sith, and then either Jedi or Phantom Menace. Okay, nice. Yeah, for me, it's a little lower. Well, a lot lower. It's well, it's kind of at the bottom. Um, Last Jedi is last. Um. I would yep, put same. I would put it right above that, like right above that. So tenth. <laughs> okay. So, not not because it's bad. Again, it's like one A, one B, one C type thing, you know. Sure. Right. Like I like all of them. I like Last Jedi. I like. Uh, well, I like parts of the Last Jedi, um, even though it's last on my list. And overall, I like Return of the Jedi. It's just at the bottom or the things I've talked about. I just think there's better Star Wars movies than that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, all 11 of these movies are in my top 30 or 50 movies mm -hmm. easily. Yeah. Um, and even the, yeah, Last Jedi is last for me in the 11, but it still ranks above 10,000 other movies I've seen <laughs> yeah. as far as favorites go. Yeah. Yeah. So... But I will try and go see it this week, and maybe it'll, it'll bump up. Maybe seen on the big screen, bumps it up to five or six. You know, you never know. So, any other comments on Return of the Jedi 40th anniversary? You know, I can't believe it's been 40 years. You know, we've lived through it all, and still like it. Uh, that's the thing, right? It's been 40 years, and it's still in my primary movie um, cabinets. Mm -hmm. And it's still a movie that if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, I'll look at, put my finger on it and think, hmm, maybe tonight. Yeah. Um, and it's still a movie we're talking about 40 years later. Yeah. And it's a movie that they released, re-released in the theater and it hit the top five of the movies that are out this week. Yeah. Which is, is kind of amazing. Um, it just really shows the, the power of the story of Return of the Jedi and the filmmaking that is in it and the characters that were created for it. And, um, it just, it, it holds up. Yeah. Yeah. I did a search for 1983 movies, <laughs> Superman three, uh, crawl. I remember liking that movie. Uh, I loved it when I was a kid. Yeah. You watch it again. The special effects are horrible. <laughs> yeah. 
Cujo. I actually, <laughs> we actually did a podcast about that, but it was more about the book. Me and one of my friends, who's a big Stephen King fan, we did a Cujo review. But uh, Death Stalker. <laughs> Never heard of that one. War Games. All right. That was good. Okay. The Outsiders. Okay. Octopussy. The Right Stuff. Was that 1983? Wow. Yeah. Uh, Never Say Never Again, Space Raiders, never heard of that one. Uh, Trying to ride in the coattails of Star Wars. Yeah. Thor the Conqueror. (laughs) Never heard of that. Okay. Uh, Those are kind of the big ones. Real Risky Business. Blue Thunder. I kind of remember that one. Um so yeah again i love blue thunder when i was a kid and it is hard to watch today yeah the special effects are awful the acting's not great and the story's like almost non-existent <laughs> <laughs> yeah scarface came out in 1983 so yeah those uh some big movies right superman 3 scarface war games um so even those ones those top tier ones risky business uh oh National Lampoon's Vacation, <laughs> Flashdance, but we're not talking about the 40th anniversary of Flashdance, right? We're not Maybe reviewing not. that. It's not being re-released in theaters. Uh, so there's something to Return of the Jedi for sure that uh, has a, a, la- a longevity to it. And <clears throat> again, like you said, you know, it's it's in the top, and every once in a while we're going to pull it out and watch it. So. Uh, definitely a good movie and a lot of a lot of cool stuff in that one. But so th- we want to thank you guys for watching us, uh, watching this podcast review of the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. If you have any different thoughts and would like to comment on the, the video saying why I'm out of my mind to rank <laughs> Return of the Jedi at number 10 of my Star Wars movies, do so. I mean, I... I'm always looking for additional opinions. I mean, I have no problem with people saying I'm crazy and it's the best movie of the Star Wars saga. But um, so, yeah, like the video, comment on the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to do some Star Wars content here in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for more of that. Um, we got a lot of good things we're going to be talking about here shortly. So thanks, guys, for, for watching, for listening, and we'll catch you next time. May the Force be with you. May the force be with you always.